It's really good to see everyone back again. And it's really good to see some new faces. So if this is your first time, uh, we are very happy you're with the Seesaw family tonight. Uh, this semester we're covering the book of Exodus. I don't know what your thought is about the book of Exodus. Uh, I... Growing up, I thought I knew all about the book of Exodus because I watched the movie The Ten Commandments many times. Uh, and I watched Prince of Egypt too, so I had, you know, a few stories in that. Okay. Uh, so I knew, I knew, okay, this is a book of miracles where God does many wonderful things for his people. Uh, and that's not wrong, that's not bad, but brothers and sisters, this semester, we want to go deeper and see the depths of the riches in the word of God. Amen. Um, and so tonight, let's all, let's all read uh, the outline title together at the very top. Ready? Go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Brothers and sisters, tonight will be a bird's eye view, and there are two things that I hope we all walk away with tonight. Uh, the first thing that I hope we all get is the six points on your outline. These six points are tremendous. I can say that because I didn't write them. But if you get these six points, you have the whole book of Exodus. Uh, and so tonight, even I hope that you would be able to speak the whole book of Exodus. You could just close your eyes and you could tell someone, you know how I started? I started enslaved in the world. But the Lord, through the Lamb and through baptism, redeemed me and saved me. And then He brought me into the wilderness where He led me, but in His leading, He supplied me with manna and water. But that was not all. Eventually, He brought me to a mountain where I saw that He has a desire. And He has a desire for a dwelling place. And ever since then, I have been living a life of building up the church. Okay? I hope we would all see this. That's the first point. The whole book would be a vision to us, and even maybe at the end we'll have some time to practice. Um, and then the second thing I hope that we all get, if you have a pen, take it out and circle point number six, and write next to it the word destination. Okay? Brothers and sisters, I never got this from the Ten Commandments that God had a destination. When He was bringing the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, there was one thing in his mind, and that was the tabernacle, okay? I never realized this until just getting into it for this message. No subject is covered as extensively in the book of Exodus as the tabernacle. Even the Exodus itself only takes up Exodus, you know, 2 through 14, okay? But there are 15 chapters dedicated to one thing, and that is the building of the tabernacle. This should really impress us that God's view when it comes to Exodus is the building of the tabernacle, which is in the New Testament, is the church, okay? So these two things, I don't want us to miss. Um, and before we come to the outline, if we want, we want to see our condition in a full way. And to do that, we need to start just before the book of Exodus. So does, does anybody... Only students, does anybody know the last verse in the book of Genesis? Anybody know the last verse in the book of Genesis? Anyone? Okay, I'll read it to you guys. It says, this is how Genesis ends. And Joseph died, being a hundred years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Um, now, if you know Genesis, you know Genesis starts off in such a positive way. It starts off with man made in God's image, according to his likeness, put in front of the tree of life, ready to fulfill God's purpose. But what happened? God's enemy came in and man fell, and he fell again, and he fell again, and he fell again. Until at the end of Genesis, actually God's purpose is far from being fulfilled. What you have is a man dead in a coffin in Egypt. Okay? And this was our situation. The Bible tells us that before we got saved, we were dead in our offenses and sins, yeah. having no hope without God in the world. Okay? So what do we need? We need an exodus. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get out of that place. Yeah. Because exodus, even though it starts in a negative way, you have God's people enslaved in Egypt. You know how the book of Exodus ends? It ends with, the, with God having His dwelling place and that dwelling place filled with the glory of God. Yes. We, so we need to be saved 
from a situation of deadness to a glorious situation where God has the desire of his heart. I I didn't realize this either. Exodus actually ends exactly the same way as the whole Bible ends. Exodus ends with God having his building and that building being filled with the glory of God. And the whole Bible ends with the tabernacle of God being with man and shining out his glory to the whole universe. Okay? So this is a wonderful book. I am so excited we're going to get into it. Um, And let's get started. How about we all read the first point on your outline. Uh, Ready, go. Okay. So this is where we start. We all started, okay? Everyone in here started enslaved. The Bible tells us before we were saved, we were, we were uh, slaves of sin, okay? But that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on these two words, in Egypt, okay? Now consider this. Egypt was the place where God's people were enslaved, okay? And what, what do you think that signifies in our experience? What is the place where God's people are enslaved. Okay. Egypt signifies the world in a very particular sense. You know, John 3.16, you have God so loved the world, but in 1 John, you have loved not the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. Okay? So there are multiple aspects to the world. Uh, And the world signified by Egypt is very particular. I have a, a definition that you can write down if you want. Um, Okay, the world signified by Egypt is Satan's system that usurps God's chosen people and preoccupies them, and this is the important part, so that they have no time for God, and they have no time for God's purpose, okay? I'll say that again. It is Satan's system that usurps God's people and preoccupies them so that they have no time for God and no time for His purpose. Okay, how do we see this? So the first place we can see this is in Exodus 5. Moses and Aaron, they've come to Pharaoh and they've told Pharaoh, let my people go. This is what Jehovah says. And Pharaoh, obviously we all know, he says, not happening. No way, no how. Okay? But... When Pharaoh sends them away, he doesn't stop there, okay? It says that later this day, later that day, he said the following verses to his, his taskmasters. Let's all read Exodus, those verses from Exodus 5. Ready, go. Yeah. Oh, Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. Brothers and sisters, did you catch the phrase, they are idle, therefore they say, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Okay, this is Pharaoh who signifies Satan, this is his thought. The problem is that they have too much time, therefore they're thinking about God. They're thinking about his purpose because they're not busy enough. Okay, what's this, and what's the solution here? What do they need? They need more work to do. They need more things to occupy them, okay? This is the world. It usurps and preoccupies God's people so they have no time for God and no time for His purpose. Okay, did you notice that the problem was not that they had a heart for the Lord? That wasn't what Pharaoh dealt with. What he dealt with was that they, they had too much time. They needed more things to occupy them, okay? I was getting into this. I was just thinking of TikTok. It's, can you be idle with TikTok? There's, there is endless content there, okay? So this was, this was Satan's system, his strategy. They, they have too much time, therefore they're starting to think about God and His purpose, okay? And the next verse I put on here is to show that this is a system, okay? Let's read Exodus 1.10. Ready, go. Okay, underline the phrase, let us deal wisely. Okay, 
I was very touched by this verse because I read it and you can see here that God's people were not enslaved in Egypt just because Pharaoh wanted more buildings. Okay, that was not the reason they were enslaved. But they were enslaved in Egypt strategically so that they would not leave Satan's kingdom. The purpose of Pharaoh's enslaving the children of Israel, it was, he said, there was some wisdom there. There was some consideration. How can I keep God's people in my kingdom? Therefore, they were enslaved. Okay? So, brothers and sisters, we need to get out of there, right? Yeah. We need an exodus. Um, okay, so let's read the next point, uh, point number two on your outline. Ready? Go. We saved. Okay, we all started off enslaved in Egypt, but praise the Lord, we got redeemed and saved. Yeah. Okay, and the first picture that we have here is the Passover. Now, okay, think about it. God's judgment was on Egypt entirely. It was on the whole land. And that included the children of Israel. They were not an exception to God's judgment on the whole land. But God made a provision for them. And what was that provision? It was the blood of a lamb. Okay? Uh, so let's read, let's read Exodus 12, 13 together. Ready? Go. And the blood shall be a sign for you upon the Okay, so this is where actually the word Passover comes from. The Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So they all had to take the blood of the lamb and they had to apply it on the outside of their house. And when God saw the blood, they were, uh, they were, they were saved from God's judgment and they were passed over. And... Uh, maybe you've already gotten there in your head, but brothers and sisters, in the New Testament, when, God, when we apply the blood of Jesus, we are saved from God's judgment. Um, but that wasn't all they did with the lamb. Did you know that? They had the blood of the lamb on the outside, but you know what was going on inside the house? They were eating the lamb. Exactly. Okay, they had to eat the lamb. <laughs> this was, so this was their strength for their exodus out of Egypt. This was like the fuel for them to get out of there was they had to eat the lamb. Okay, you want to get out of the world? You got to eat the lamb. Okay, you eat the lamb, you have strength and fuel to get out of the world. But <clears throat> experiencing the Passover was not the end. Okay, the Passover saved them from God's judgment. It gave them a little bit of strength. Um, but they were still in Egypt under Pharaoh's tyranny. So you know what God prepared? God in His sovereign creation of the earth prepared the Red Sea as a giant baptistry for the children of Israel. So, okay, can I have Brad, David, Carson, and Tino? Can y'all come up here really quick? Okay, so Brad, you're the children of Israel, okay? Say, uh, Tino, you're Pharaoh. Oh, no. oh, okay. And David and Carson, you brothers are the Red Sea. <laughs> okay, so, okay, y'all two come here, and then Tino and Brad, can y'all go over there? So, Brad is the children of Israel. He wants to get out, okay? But Pharaoh is not letting him go. He doesn't, even though Brad wants to get out, Pharaoh is right here, and he has a hold on him, okay? This is why we need the baptistry, okay? Because when the children of Israel, they went into the Red Sea. Okay, come on, Brad. And then Tino, a.k.a. Pharaoh, he goes in with them, right? But then Brad, he comes up on the other side, and let's all read Exodus 1430 together. <laughs> Okay, Red Sea brothers, take them down. <laughs> okay, 
when you get baptized, you go into the, the, the waters. Uh, here, y'all can sit down. Thank you. You go into the waters. You take Pharaoh and his armies with you. But through baptism, you experience an absolute and thorough deliverance. Because when you come up on the other side, you look back and you see Pharaoh and his armies dead on the seashore. Everything that was holding you back from being for God's purpose, everything that was trying to keep you in the world, where is it? It's dead on the seashore. Hallelujah. Okay. And, yeah, I wanted, okay, and I wanted to just share. When I got baptized, um, nobody told me about this, okay? Nobody told me about this, but when I got home that day after getting baptized, there were definite things in my apartment that the Lord showed me they had to go, okay? And there were definite things that from that day on were never a part of my life, okay? So this is not just a teaching. This, is, this, this was written... Thousands of years ago, but it is so real for us today. Yeah. Um, so, hallelujah for baptism, okay? This is wonderful. God has brought us out of Egypt, and Pharaoh and his armies are dead on the seashore, okay? But, God saved the children of Israel out of Egypt with a purpose. So, God is not done. Usually, at this point, Hollywood is done. There is not that much more for Hollywood to capitalize on, but God is not done. <laughs> okay? So, the next point is that He led them. When they were in the wilderness, He led them. Um, and let's read Exodus 13, 21 together. Go. Okay, so we won't spend a lot of time here, but this just shows us how the Lord leads us. So the cloud here signifies the Spirit, and the fire signifies the Word. Uh, and so it is by enjoying the Spirit and the Word that we get God's leading. Amen. Sometimes we're in the day and we're enjoying the Lord. We're, we're enjoying the Spirit and we have God's leading in that way. Other times we might feel like we're in a night in our Christian lives, and it's at that time that we need the Word. Um, and that's how the Lord's leading comes to us. But of course, John 6, 63 tells us the words that the Lord spoke are spirit and our life. So just enjoy the spirit and the word. Yeah. Um, but let's go on to the next point. As they were in the wilderness, they needed to be supplied. Okay. Um, when they were in the wilderness, they needed food and water. And God took care of both of these needs. And he, he took care of them in very miraculous ways, right? I mean, the children of Israel, they just woke up in the morning and there was, there was food on the ground. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Mark, have you ever woken up and there's an omelet on your nightstand? <laughs> this has never happened to me, right? If it happens, you're probably, you know, double-checking the locks on your door. <laughs> um, same thing with the, man, with, the, with the water. There was just a rock that followed them wherever they went. Yeah. And whenever they just spoke to the rock, they got water. Yeah. That's very miraculous. Okay. But just like with the Red Sea, there was something miraculous in an outward way, but God's supply of the children of Israel in the wilderness has an intrinsic significance. Okay. Something deeper we want to see. What do y'all think? Does anyone have a guess? What is the intrinsic significance of manna and water? in the wilderness. Jesus. <laughs> Never wrong. Never wrong. Uh, okay. So think about this. All the children of Israel, they had gotten out of Egypt. But you know what? Egypt hadn't gotten out of them. Okay. They had been there for something like 430 years. Okay. As far back as they can remember, their ancestors all were, grow were living in Egypt, okay? So outwardly, they were God's people. They were Israelites. But inwardly, their constitution was totally Egyptian, okay? So they, they, were, they were God's people in, in one sense, but in another sense, they were exactly the same as all the Egyptians, okay? So they needed, they needed a reconstituting supply, Okay, they needed, they needed a heavenly diet that would make them into different people. Um, okay, and I have a verse that's not on y'all's outline that I, I wanted to uh, read y'all to illustrate this. 
Um, this is Numbers 11, 5 through 6. The children of Israel, they were going through a hard time. And they started complaining. And they said, We remember the fish that we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The melons and the onions and the leeks and the garlic. But now our appetite has gone and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. <laughs> Can you believe that? I don't know. Maybe this, is, this, this, is, this might be relatable to, to some of us. Another solid ground. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just, oh, I, you know, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> it wasn't so bad before I got saved. Um, okay. So God brought them out into the wilderness. And they're there, they're His people, but inwardly their constitution is Egyptian. So what did God do? God put them on a diet. Yep. Okay? God put them on a diet of manna and living water for 40 years. And this was a reconstituting diet. Yes. Okay? This is not like any three-month fad that you might go on that will lose X amount of weight. This was 40 years of nothing but Christ as the true bread out of heaven. Yes. Okay? And at the end of those 40 years, when they went into the good land, they came out of Egypt one kind of way. They went into the good land an entirely different kind of way because of their diet, okay? I just appreciate this is God's way. God didn't come to correct them outwardly. He gave them food every morning. He gave them water whenever they spoke. So, brothers and sisters, we need to eat, okay? If we want to become a different kind of people, we need to eat. When you're there and you're having a morning time with the Lord in the Word, okay, and when you are going about your day, you're calling on the Lord. On the one hand, you're getting supplied, but you know what else is really happening? You are getting reconstituted to become a different kind of person. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, UT, UT has the freshman 15. Right. <laughs> okay. You know what God has? God has the man of 40. <laughs> okay? We don't want the freshman 15. We want the man of 40. <laughs> This is for reconstitution. <laughs> okay, now let's keep going. The third thing, or the, what point are we on? Five. The fifth, the fifth. Okay, was that they received revelation concerning who God is. Or, well, they received revelation. And they received revelation concerning three things. Uh, the first thing was they received revelation concerning who God is. You know, if you think about it, they were, they were in Egypt, like I said, 430 years. They, they knew things that God had done. They had probably even prayed to God. But they didn't know who this God was. They didn't know what He was like. They didn't know His attributes. So the Lord, He brought them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, He gave them the Ten Commandments. And these Ten Commandments primarily revealed who God is to them. After all this time, they, they, they got to know this God. He is a jealous God. He is a righteous God. He is loving. He is truthful. He is pure. Okay? So this is wonderful. They got to know who God is. And the second thing they received revelation concerning was the living they needed to match God. That's right. Um, but thirdly, and this is, really, this is really what I want to spend some time on because this is what everything before this has been building towards. The third thing they got revelation concerning was the desire of God's heart for a building. Amen. Okay, so let's all read Exodus 25.8 together. Ready, go. Let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. Okay. Now, in this verse, there are two words that represent a dramatic shift in the book of Exodus and a dramatic shift in our Christian lives. So far, I haven't gotten any responses to my questions, but does anybody have a guess of what these two words are that represent a dramatic shift? Anyone else? Oh, I heard it. Okay. For me. Yeah. Everybody underline these words for me. Amen. Okay. Everything to this point of Exodus was for the children of Israel. The, the Passover lamb, the Red Sea, the manna, the cloud, all of it was for the children of Israel. And then you come to this verse and there is 
a for me. Okay? For the first time, God is unveiling what He wants for Himself. This, oh Lord Jesus, I don't have the words, but I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. From this verse on until the end of the book of Exodus, the one thing that is covered is the tabernacle. Okay? This is, this is chapter 25 of 40, and it's like God gets on this point, and He just can't stop talking about it. Yeah. It's like He's been waiting for so long. Yeah. Oh, the desire of my heart, and finally here I, I get the chance. Let them make a sanctuary for me, and He does not stop talking about it until the end of the whole book. Amen. Until the tabernacle is finished, and He can come and dwell on it, He does not leave this point. Oh, I hope we're impressed. The church. Yeah. Oh, Lord Jesus, the church. Yeah. This, oh my goodness, brothers and sisters, this is the desire of God's heart. Yeah. Just, I, I'm, just the fact that God spends so much time should give us a window into how much the building, the church is on His heart. Yeah. How much there is concerning the church in the heart of God. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. You know, this is a bad example, but, <laughs> but uh, my wife and I, we had a son in November, okay? Uh, yes. Anyway, this is why it's a bad example. Okay, if you ask me about my son, you better have some time, okay? Because there is a lot in my heart concerning that boy. Um... It is the same way with God, only infinitely deeper. Infinitely deeper. He, he just has so much to say when it comes to the church. Okay? And, you know, brothers and sisters, as I was considering this, I realized I can't, I can't do this. I can't, con I can't adequately convey the heart of God to you all. Um, and, but, you know, one thing I appreciate David shared at the Welcome Back Dinner. If, you, if we would pray, oh, here's David. Um, if you would pray, Lord, make the desire of your heart the desire of my heart, then, oh, watch out. <laughs> then, that, that is a prayer that God would just, oh, he would be so happy to answer. Amen. And then what happens when, when, when the desire of the heart of God comes to you and you realize that he wants your cooperation, there is, you, you touch the meaning of the universe and the meaning of your Christian life. There is, there is, it is just not words to describe the deep, profound change in your being that will take place when it is revealed to you that God wants a dwelling place. Amen. So, anyway, I would encourage you all, pray this prayer. Amen. Pray, Lord, I want the desire of your heart to become the desire of my heart. Yeah. And... This, I mean, you will touch the depths of the heart of God. Um, okay, let's go to the last point. Uh, building the tabernacle, okay? Oh man, I'm just getting excited. Okay, first God reveals the tabernacle in great depth. Every detail, He talks about this building, okay? And I will be honest with you all. When I, I kind of was, you know, looking through Exodus, and I, I expected that after God went into all this detail about the design of the tabernacle, I expected the, next, the last two verses to be, and so they did it, according to what God said, and it was finished. Okay? That is not what happens. After, after God unveils the design, there are still six more chapters of just them doing what He just said. Okay, their whole journey after the revelation of the tabernacle was building the tabernacle. Okay, they saw it. God spent so much time to unveil it, and then they spent the rest of their journey to build it. Okay, and this, brothers and sisters, this should impress us. Once we see the desire of God's heart, we have nothing else to do, okay? There is nothing else for us except to build the church. This, this shows us the course of our Christian life, the journey of our Christian life. The, the way forward is just to build the church, okay? And they built the church, and, uh, or they built the tabernacle until 
You get to these verses, and let's read Exodus 40, 33 to 34. Go. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, and put up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of Gideon, and the glory of the whole of the tabernacle. Amen. Okay, just like the book of Exodus, there is one thing. The building of God's dwelling place until it is finished and the glory of God can dwell in it. The rest of our Christian life, our whole Christian life consists of building the church until the dwelling place of God is completed and the dwelling of God is with man and the glory of God is shining out to the whole universe. Um, anyway, hallelujah. This, okay, this is the book of Exodus, okay? I'm... Uh, maybe uh, now we can take some time. Let's see how many. Okay, we got time. Maybe we can take the next couple minutes. Uh, just get in groups with those around you and practice. Uh, practice these points. To speak to one another. You know how I started? I started enslaved in Egypt, but through the blood of the Lamb and through baptism, I got redeemed and saved. Yeah. And then the Lord brought me out, but. With his, his bringing me out and his leading me, there was a supply of manna and water. I'm on the manna 40 getting reconstituted. Yeah. But this was not all because eventually God showed me the desire of his heart. And my, the rest of my life is building the church. Okay, so we can stop here and uh, maybe we'll get into, get into groups with those around you. And then